The Tuskegee Syphilis Study, conducted from 1932 to 1972, stands as a painful chapter in American history, particularly for the Black community. Initially intended to understand the effects of untreated syphilis, the study involved the exploitation of hundreds of Black men in Alabama who were misled into believing they were receiving free health care for bad blood. Despite penicillin becoming widely available in the 1940s as an effective treatment for syphilis, the researchers deliberately withheld it from the participants to observe the disease's progression. This unethical study not only inflicted immense suffering on individuals and their families, but also eroded trust in medical institutions among Black Americans, reverberating through generations. It serves as a stark reminder of the dangers of systemic racism in healthcare, the importance of informed consent, and the ongoing struggle for equity and justice in medical research. They were told they'd get treated for their bad blood. Instead, hundreds of poor black men became participants unknowingly in a shocking and truly shameful chapter of American medical history. In 1932, the United States Public Health Service launched an unethical research project to examine the effects of untreated syphilis. The project was called the Tuskegee Study because it recruited 600 black men living in Tuskegee, Alabama. Researchers told the men that they were being treated for bad blood, a term used locally to describe anything from fatigue to anemia. They promised the men free medical treatment if they participated. While two-thirds of the men in the study were confirmed to have syphilis, not one received proper treatment for the disease they had contracted. So this was a study in which there was no consent on the part of those who, um, who were being studied, also deception on the part of the U.S. government. When penicillin became the recommended treatment for syphilis in the 1940s, Tuskegee researchers scandalously withheld the drug from the men in the study so that they could continue to chart the course of the disease when untreated. Many patients experienced damage to their vital organs and nervous systems. For some, the lack of treatment led to death. The great shame of the study is that the men thought that they were being treated. Treatment was withheld from them, even after it was very clear what kind of medical treatment would cure them of syphilis. In 1972, an Associated Press article exposed the Tuskegee study after one of the participants brought the story to a civil rights attorney. Only then, after 40 years, was the study brought to an end. The case was settled out of court for $10 million. This long history of medical experimentation on African Americans creates a sense of distrust, uh, a distrust of doctors and physicians, a distrust of medical care. In 1997, President Bill Clinton formally apologized to the victims of the study. The President's apology was a welcome first step, but we still have a long way to go before the legacy of mistrust of science within the black community is fully overcome. The Willowbrook State School Study, which took place from the 1950s to the 1970s in New York, reflects a disturbing intersection of institutional neglect and exploitation, particularly affecting vulnerable populations, including many black families. Willowbrook was an institution for individuals with intellectual disabilities, and the study aimed to investigate the progression of hepatitis by deliberately infecting children with the virus. Many of these children were poor, and their families had limited choices, often coerced into participation under the guise of receiving care and educational support. What set this study apart is not only the ethical breaches that occurred, but also the broader implications regarding how marginalized communities are often disregarded in the name of research. The treatment of these children was unconscionable, reducing their lives to mere data points without informed consent or proper oversight. This horrific legacy contributes to a deep mistrust of medical institutions in the black community, echoing historical injustices and reminding us of the need for vigilance and advocacy in protecting the most vulnerable among us. 
the Willowbrook study serves as a crucial lesson about the importance of ethical standards in research and our ongoing responsibility to confront systemic inequalities in healthcare. More than 50 years ago, a tenacious investigative reporter by the name of Geraldo Rivera shed light on an atrocity that was happening for decades in New York State. That was the Willowbrook State School on Staten Island. It opened in 1947 and was seen as the only option for parents struggling to care for children with developmental disabilities. They were told their children would have access to care and education, but their reality was just the opposite. Many of the children were left alone in dark, dirty rooms without enough food to eat. There were reports of children covered in urine and feces, and hepatitis was common. In 1972, Rivera produced a shocking expose about the conditions. How is it living on the ward that you live? This place. The attendants are trying their best, but the staff is just too small to do anything more than just try and keep the place clean. No rehabilitation, no training, nothing. And after a class action lawsuit, Willowbrook closed in 1987. To mark more than 50 years since Rivera's expose, a documentary was released. It was produced by the state's Council on Developmental Disabilities and the Office of General Services. We sent a crew to capture the premiere in the capital region. The idea for a documentary came to us about a year ago when we began producing a series of videos commemorating the 50th anniversary of Geraldo Rivera's expose. Our first interview in this series was with Geraldo and Bernard Carabello, and what they had to say was so compelling we thought, there is more of this story that we need to tell. At the premiere of the documentary, survivors, supporters, and longtime advocates shared their respective stories on the Willowbrook State School while stressing the importance of continuing to remember the tragedy that was Willowbrook. Thank you for pushing for change, for sounding the alarm, for your tremendous advocacy. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I know they feel the same. Deborah Weisbach had a brother named Robert. Robert was affectionately known as Robbie to his loved ones. Robert was placed at Willowbrook State School at just six years old in 1958. Deborah spoke about the anger she felt about the conditions of Willowbrook. And it was about four years after he died, I was in high school when the expose came out, which was um, extremely overwhelming and horrifying to me. I secretly watched the news. I secretly peeked at the newspaper. We never ever discussed it at home. And I was confused and angry and just couldn't comprehend why in the world my parents would have sent their son to this horrible place and have pretty much deserted him. And I, I spent years being angry. It's just important for me that my brother not be forgotten. And he, um, he meant something. He meant something to me. I know now that he mattered deeply. Like Deborah, Jose Rivera also had a brother at the Willowbrook State School. Jose has continued to shed light on the pain, trauma, and regret his family has endured after putting his brother, Louis, in the state school with egregious conditions that they had no idea about. Uh, as per the professionals at the time, uh, Willowbrook was the only option. Um, unfortunately, what that did is caused a significant trauma, emotional damage to my parents, and I think to the family, and I think my parents struggled with what they suddenly realized had happened when they took the lead of the professionals and recognized that Lewis was not getting what they were led to believe Lewis was going to get, and Lewis regressed. Um, so this documentary is, is, is um, uh, intent, hopefully, is to remind people of what can occur when we disregard human life, human beings, and, and what a human being is able to achieve when given the necessary supports, um, assistance, and an opportunity to thrive. People like my brother were isolated and hidden away from society when they were institutionalized. And there are families today who still bear that, that struggle, that suffering for having placed their child in a, in a state 
institution um, and, and, and under, uh, misled by what they were, thought they were going to get for their child. So I hope that message comes out loud and clear from this documentary. Um, and it's remembered uh, for future generations to come. While the groundbreaking Willowbrook expose was over 50 years ago, advocates say more still needs to be done to further advance the way in which people with developmental disabilities are cared for and looked after. One of those advocates is Willie Mae Goodman. After her daughter Margaret faced Willowbrook, Willie Mae became a fearless disability rights advocate and co-chair of the Willowbrook Committee. She underscored concerns many advocates had about Willowbrook and about how people with disabilities are cared for today. The system is dealing more with paper than is with people. I know they got a saying, putting people first. They are not putting people first. They put in paper first. And I have a problem with that. I'm hoping that with this, that people get to understand people like who has a disability, who can't speak. I'm hoping they will understand they have a right to live in a decent environment. They have a right to live in a community and they have a right to participate in anything everybody else participate in. The Philadelphia Human Experimentation, particularly during the 1960s and 1970s, highlights a troubling and often overlooked chapter in medical history, marked by the exploitation of marginalized communities, including many black individuals. In this context, vulnerable populations were subjected to unethical medical experiments without their full understanding or consent, primarily centered around testing treatments for various conditions, including tuberculosis and mental health issues. Many of those involved were from low-income neighborhoods, highlighting a disturbing pattern where those with the least power and resources were manipulated in the name of scientific advancement. The experiments often disregarded the well-being of participants, viewing them as mere subjects rather than as human beings deserving of dignity and respect. This exploitation contributed to a deep-seated mistrust of the medical establishment in black communities, rooted in a history of systemic racism and disenfranchisement. As we reflect on these injustices, it is crucial to acknowledge the lessons learned regarding consent, ethics, and accountability in research. The Philadelphia Human Experimentation underscores the necessity of advocating for the rights and voices of marginalized individuals in all aspects of healthcare, ensuring that such violations of trust and humanity are never repeated. It really was the Kmart of human experimentation from 1951 to 1974. Holmberg Prison closed in 1996, but Alan Hornblum says what happened during the 50s, 60s, and 70s will live on forever. The researcher showed us photos inside his book, Acres of Skin. Well, what you see in this bottom picture is the prototypic experiment that took place at Holmesburg. In some cases, it could just be very plain soap. In other cases, it could be a carcinogenic chemical. The inmates were never told. Hornblum was a literacy instructor at the prison in the 1970s when he noticed many black prisoners in bad shape. He says UPenn dermatologist Albert Kligman led experiments on prisoners. The inmates were paid a dollar a day, but it cost them their health. For his book, Hornblum spoke to Dr. Kligman before he died in 2010. He thought what took place here was fine. According to his observation, uh, the inmates were treated fairly. Philadelphia shut down the experiments in 1974 two years after the Tuskegee syphilis experiment made national headlines. But the damage to the former inmates was already done. They have lots of fears and regrets. They never really learned what they were testing or being injected with. Almost a half century later, a survey shows 53% of blacks view medical scientists positively compared to whites and Hispanics. I'm not surprised at all. Dr. Ayla Stanford heads the Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium, a group of predominantly black doctors who offer free testing in Philadelphia's low-income neighborhoods. Black communities in Philadelphia have a disproportionately high number of COVID cases and deaths. The consortium is working to break down the walls of mistrust among African-Americans. 
but you actually listen to what they're asking and you show them the testing kit. You demonstrate how it's gonna be done. And Dr. Stanford says black doctors only make up 5% of all physicians in America. So educating white doctors about black health care is crucial. You have to acknowledge what your own implicit biases are when you see a six foot five African American male come into your office. In Holmesburg, Brandon Hudson, NBC 10 News. Acres of Skin, the documentary, sheds light on a harrowing episode in American medical history that underscores the exploitation and dehumanization of black individuals, particularly in the context of human experimentation. The film delves into the story of the Holmesburg prison in Philadelphia, where from the 1950s to the 1970s, inmates were subjected to unethical experiments sponsored by pharmaceutical companies and the US military. Many of these men, predominantly from marginalized communities, were offered small financial incentives in exchange for their consent, often without a full understanding of the risks involved. This documentary reveals the blatant disregard for the dignity and rights of these individuals, highlighting how systemic racism and social inequities shape their experiences. The experiments included testing harmful substances, such as toxic agents and skin diseases, fundamentally treating these men as mere subjects expendable and silenced. Acres of Skin is more than just an historical account. It serves as a powerful reminder of the critical importance of informed consent and ethical standards in medical research, especially when it involves in marginalized groups. It also calls for a reckoning with the legacy of such practices, challenging us to ensure that the voices and rights of all individuals, particularly those from black and disadvantaged backgrounds, are respected and upheld in healthcare and research today. By confronting these truths, we honor those who suffered and demand a more equitable future. Anthony and Jesse Williams know these walls well. Both men spent time behind these grim 30-foot high fieldstone walls, the ominous walls of Philadelphia's Holmesburg prison. As young men in their teens and 20s, they served time here after being arrested for assorted crimes. Most of the men imprisoned here were either awaiting trial or serving county sentences of less than two years. In time, however, they and thousands of men and women like them would gradually come to feel that in addition to being sent to prison, they had been sentenced to science as well. For Edward Anthony and Jesse Williams, these gloomy cell blocks and barren cells harken back to a desperate and painful period in their lives a period when they felt they had no other alternative than to become human guinea pigs, experimental lab rats used for the benefit and profit of others. Today, many of them are embarrassed by their time at Holmesburg and refuse to speak about the experiments they allowed themselves to take part in. Others are angry. They want to know how society, the prison system, as well as one of the elite institutions of higher learning in the country could have used them for a wide array of scientific studies, experiments that ran the gamut from the relatively harmless you to the truly dangerous. Me. I was used. We've seen Holmesburg becoming a house of horror, and we've seen the doctors becoming Frankensteins, you know, and, and we felt that, you know, it had to be stopped before individuals come walking out of there backwards. The former inmate test subjects were not alone in their search for answers. Others who were there at the time, or who subsequently examined the long history of the testing program, have their own questions and thoughts about what went on here. Holmesburg was the Kmart of human research in post-war America. Anything that anybody wanted done on a human could be accomplished there. The doctors who ran the program from what I've gathered, never said no to anyone, whether it was Dow Chemical or R.J. Reynolds or whether it was the CIA. If they wanted things tested on humans, it could be attained there. Dr. Klugman uh, was an entrepreneur as much as he was a physician, and he was interested in, because of his own curiosity, of building a panoply of, of products and, and associations and he was able to accomplish all of that during the 50s and 60s. The, the Holmesburg situation uh, really has a lot of um, features in common with the Tuskegee 
uh, syphilis study. And the, the critical ones from my perspective are the lack of the freedom and capacity of the people involved who were subjected to the experiment to really exercise free judgment. Um, this is independent of the question of how much information they got. You start with the situation that the people are in. In Tuskegee, they were poor, totally deprived of um, any economic opportunities, many of them uneducated. In the Holmesburg situation, we have similar uh, similar problems and maybe even more exacerbated in terms of freedom obviously because they didn't have the capacity to even move about or decide when to go to the bathroom on their own so in that regard we're starting out with people who are vulnerable a uh, large population of people who are vulnerable who are poor for the most part and who are uneducated I had heard rumors as everybody did who was out there of what had gone on in times past and some uh, people who were acolytes of Kligman and had worked there as residents, some of them in California, at the University of California in San Francisco, had been said to have done horrendous experiments, surgical procedures that were really um, horrific. Tests they now believe went too far. They cut my back, cut some pieces out, layers of skin. They had a test back then where they were burning guys with radiation. Yeah. Uh, it was on the LSD test. With funding from major pharmaceutical companies, among others, Holmesburg had become a testing ground for experimental medical products and procedures. I had took the toothpaste test in the mid-60s at a very early age. Mm -hmm. I lost all of my teeth by mm -hmm. the time I was 23 years old. This is where the experiments were generally performed. The prison eventually closed. And what went on there was nearly forgotten. But Alan Hornblum, a Temple University professor who worked at the prison in the early 70s, never forgot what he saw. Since the publication of the book, Acres of Skin, that first revealed the true extent of the Holmesburg medical experiments in 1998 and the intense media interest in the book's revelations, the former test subjects have formed their own organization, the Experimentation Survivors. The group, now several hundred strong, has provided counseling to those members in need, lectured at several college forums about their days at Holmesburg, initiated a series of protest demonstrations against those they believe orchestrated the experiments, and testified at several state and local investigative hearings. In addition, they filed a federal lawsuit against a prominent dermatologist an Ivy League University, and the city of Philadelphia. They are determined to finally attain justice. Post-war America was a hotbed of human experimentation in American prisons. Everything from flash burn studies in Virginia to testicular irradiation studies in Oregon and Washington State, live cancer cell injections in Ohio State Penitentiary. At least half the states had one prison that was doing experimentation. Pennsylvania, unfortunately, had nine or ten, Holmesburg being the greatest example of this. Holmesburg was really a department store of opportunity. Anything could be done that a corporate or a private entity was interested in. Possible death or liberty. This is the risk 10 convicts are volunteering to take in the fight against sleeping sickness. We're doing this for the sake of humanity. From the early 20th century, when they were used for pellagra and testicular transplant experiments, to a half century later, when they were incorporated in cancer and psychotropic drug studies, prisoners as test subjects were a desired commodity. The test begins. In glass tubes with gauze at the ends are mosquitoes which were fed on victims of the St. Louis epidemic. Will their bite affect these men? That is science's question. Can you feel a mosquito biting? Yes, ma'am. In response to the fiendish acts committed by Nazi doctors on concentration camp prisoners during the Second World War, the United States put 23 German physicians and medical administrators on trial for their acts. After seven doctors had been sentenced to death, and many others to lengthy prison terms, the American jurist handed down a code of conduct for research physicians to ensure that such inhuman acts in the name of science would never happen again. The Nuremberg Code's first principle, 
not only requires the voluntary consent of the test subject, but also states, the person involved should have legal capacity to give consent, should be so situated as to be able to exercise free power of choice without the intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, overreaching, or other ulterior form of constraint or coercion, and should have sufficient knowledge and comprehension of the elements of the subject matter involved as to enable him to make an understanding and enlightened decision. It was America that tried the Nazis, harangued them about their practices, and finally executed uh, seven of them by hanging, and many others uh, were given long prison sentences. But oddly enough, America was very reluctant to buy in to the Nuremberg Code. In the 50s and 60s was really the golden age of human research and some fairly nasty, unsavory things were done in America on retarded children, on senior citizens, on all sorts of institutionalized populations, including prisoners. I think that you know James Jones, when he did his book on bad blood, and there was an interview done with some of the doctors who had involved themselves in that experiment, and they were asked, do you see um, anything wrong with it? And, and um, they responded, no, I don't see anything wrong with what we did. Uh, I think really provokes a lot of thought because one has to wonder how the individuals were able to act and yet distinguish themselves from what was going on. If you remember Tuskegee was going on um, before and after uh, uh, the Nuremberg trials and so the response that was given by one of the uh, experimenters was well they were Nazis and to that extent what in his mind what he was suggesting is that they couldn't be trusted and we can and so there is a blind spot that occurs in America when people look on the outside and then compare the same situation on the inside and don't see the similarities. And again, I think it comes back to my basic principle that if you don't see the individuals, even within America, as being of equal human status, then you are able in your own mind to say what we're doing is different because if you look at the Nazis, they were identifying evil people who were the experimenters. They said, we're good people. What's left out is who are the victims and what are the justifications for exposing the victims to the risk, and they are the same. It was in the early 1950s, and Holmesburg Prison was forced to deal with another in a recurring series of outbreaks of athlete's foot. The prison, a vestige of the late 19th century, was underfunded, unsanitary and overcrowded. In an effort to grapple with the fungus problem, prison medical personnel contacted a young dermatology professor at the University of Pennsylvania who had recently published a series of articles on the subject. The physician, Albert M. Kligman, had previously earned a PhD in mycology and specialized in fungi. Desiring to be helpful, Kligman visited the Maximum Security Institution in Northeast Philadelphia. Upon entering the institution and its large rotunda, Kligman witnessed hundreds of aimless, seemingly hopeless prisoners. The impact of seeing so many destitute, incarcerated men was nothing short of startling. As Kligman later admittedly said of the incident, he felt like a farmer seeing a fertile field for the first time. The enterprising researcher realized he had come upon something truly unusual a colony under perfect control conditions. Awestruck, but quick to size up the situation, Dr. Kligman recognized that large numbers of semi-illiterate men being warehoused for long periods of time could be of enormous value. The Penn researcher had discovered acres of skin. It wasn't long before Dr. Kligman approached prison superintendent Frederick Baldy requesting permission to perform some rudimentary clinical experiments on the prisoners. Baldy, a physician himself, thought the clinical studies a novel idea that might benefit the prisoners as well as the university, and agreed to allow Kligman to perform his studies. The agreement between the University of Pennsylvania professor and the city prison boss was sealed with a handshake. 
The result would be one of the largest human experimentation factories in post-war America. For the next quarter century, more inmates would take part in more scientific experiments at the prison than just about any other research facility in the country. Dr. Kligman embarked on a wide array of dermatologic studies. His use of imprisoned Philadelphians was not altogether surprising for an ambitious researcher who had already incorporated retarded children in his scientific studies. In the late 1940s, for example, Kligman had used children at the Vineyard and Woodbine Institutions for the Feeble-Minded in South Jersey for experiments with poison ivy and various forms of fungus. Some of these experiments were carried over to the prison population. The poison ivy experiments, for example, garnered Kligman national media attention and a three-page spread in a 1955 issue of Life magazine, referred to as the poison ivy picker of Pennypack Park, Kligman was portrayed as an innovative researcher utilizing the nation's wealth of institutionalized troublemakers for the public good. Photographs showed Kligman collecting the dreaded plant in a nearby park and prisoners lining up to be slathered with poison ivy. Possessed with a highly inquisitive and lively mind, Dr. Kligman explored a great variety of subjects. Some were quite innocent and others were more daring and held a degree of risk to the inmate subjects. Some experiments inoculated scores of prisoners in their face, scalp, and even their penis with various viruses like wart virus and herpes simplex. Others infected prisoners with enormous quantities of ringworm. Prisoners received the sum one dollar or two a day for their participation. This was a princely sum compared to the meager rewards for one of the scarce prison jobs that earned the inmate only a quarter a day Inmates participated not because they were patriotic, not because they wanted to advance science. They were interested in gaining some money. These men were desperate and they were all interested in having money, just as you are on the street. A lot of guys in Holmesburg prison was paying heavy prices because they had no money and money at that time was cigarettes. Some guys were being raped, some guys were being stabbed, and some guys were being brutally treated because they didn't have money. So I knew I did need money in places such as Holmesburg. 10 cents a day, 25 cents a day at tops. And the experiments paid, the less they would pay is like a dollar for some tests, for some tests. And some experiments that went on paid other things. I still believe what had happened with all the experiments I was on, they gave us chicken fee because we were in need for money. This was a well put together project where they saw the situation, they examined it, they studied it, and they knew what to do to get top performance from all of us. So I think uh, what they did was they played us and they played us well. For the most part, they were indigent people uh, poor people, and me too, and um, nobody sent us 50 or $100 a week to be in jail, no. Uh, when we heard about the test, when I heard about it, I was really elated, I was glad. If the inmate population was enticed by the economic prospects of the prison research, the nation's pharmaceutical community was equally enamored by the prospect of doing business behind bars. The post-war years were a period of tremendous growth for drug companies, and test subjects were crucial to their business. Vulnerable, institutionalized populations such as orphans, the retarded, and those in hospitals were an attractive commodity to the nation's scientific community. Confined, unquestioning, and inexpensive, prison inmates were particularly desirable and soon became the guinea pigs of choice. As one scholar has said of the relaxed ethical atmosphere, it was the gilded age of research. It didn't take the nation's pharmaceutical community very long to learn of Dr. Kligman's human research studies. The prospect of working with a respected Ivy League researcher who had unlimited access to a confined test population made for a very appealing alliance. Gradually, pharmaceutical giants like Smith Klein, 
Johnson & Johnson, Carter Wallace, came to Dr. Kligman requesting clinical trials be performed at the prison. They offered a handsome financial reward for the dermatology professor's cooperation. Rarely did Kligman turn them down. Within a short period of time, every commercial product from deodorants and detergents to diet drinks and mouthwash were being tested on inmates. Many of the studies, such as those dealing with toothpaste and dandruff, were relatively tame. Others, however, such as phase one pharmaceutical testing, were considerably more dangerous. Well, as far as strains, I went over there one morning and I seen a, a ladder, steps, you walk up, and at the top of the steps were a toilet seat. And a camera was behind it. And I said, well, I asked, what is this for? He's big taking pictures of a guy defecating. You know what I mean? And then I come over there another time, and here's a guy, and he take his shirt off, and he's grown dressed like a woman. And I, what kind of test is this? It's a hormone test, where, where this guy's whole nature is turning around from them injecting hormones in. The experiment that I got involved in was an uh, experiment for athletes' feet. All right, this experiment was supposed to be an athlete's foot um, preventive. All right, so they approached me and they told me that I'd be wearing this uh, powder, which was some type of preventive for athletes' feet for a week, and I'd be receive fifty dollars for this. Well, fifty dollars sounded good at the time. What this experiment involved. Uh, I was brought to a, it's a cell that we use for all the other experiments, a, a plastic bag it was wrapped around my right foot up to a little bit below my knee. Then the powder was dumped into the bag. Okay? Now, at the top, a little bit below the knee, duct tape was wrapped around the leg. Now I had to wear this bag with the powder for a full week. I had, when I bathed, I mean showered, uh, went to chow, did any kind of exercise, this bag had to stay on uh, or else I wouldn't got paid for it. A well, week went by, was taken back to the same room and the attendants removed the bag and uh, there was about three of us in the room when they removed. There was three people involved in the same test. Well, the odor was so uh, excruciating that we almost passed out. We had to walk out of this room just, just to catch our air, just to catch the breath. Now, as far as my leg, it was all shriveled up. Um, I guess lack of moisture or too much moisture, whatever it was, it was all white, it was all shriveled got money, money was put on the books, and that was, that was it, I thought. Uh, next day, I had no problem, but the second day when I woke up, got the, I got stepped out of my bunk, tried to stand up, and I fell flat on my face. Turned out that the leg that had the experiment, a knee was, uh, a nerve was severed in the right leg. After that experiment, I had my fill of their experiments. That was the last experiment I participated in, and that's the last uh, experiment I've ever participated in. They took my lip and they put it on my arm, and they took my arm and they put it in my lip. I come over there where um, they have a dandruff test, you know, where they rub something on your chest, all the guy's hair fall out. Then they put something on uh, uh, um, the head, and uh, if you had a bad grade of hair, you would be walking around uh, when the hair grew back. If you were black, you would have hair like a European. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. You know, uh, 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 toothpaste test, where guys was using the toothpaste. Next thing you know, they in the mess hall and the teeth just falling out. I was told not to drink of, the, of, of that test, don't take any liquids because um, those that drank it, uh, there's a yellow line on the center of Holmesburg, it's called the center, where you can stand and look down all the blocks. Uh, it's a yellow line 
and they would open the door and you walked out, even if you had a visit or you had to go to the infirmary or wherever, uh, you couldn't cross that line. If you did, you would get beat up and put in a hole. Well, they had a pay me no mind list. They had all these guys that was drinking uh, this liquid stuff. Uh, they would walk around. They would actually and literally walk into the wall. Eh, to those guys, it was a way to make a buck. These were experiments being done by, I guess, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, these were experiments, and they made them sound very palatable. Shampoo experiments, toothpaste experiments, trying them out on people. And so prisoners were first. It seemed real uh, non-threatening, the way that was explained. But I seen guys come back to the block walking like zombies with the big paper cups attached to their inner arms and in their legs. And later I saw under those cups silver dollar sized scars. Uh, these were either from chemicals they put on them or radiation. I wasn't sure which but they were ugly silver dollar sized scars. And I, I seen guys 20, 30 years later on the street, they still had those scars. Though the number and variety of medical experiments performed at Holmesburg continued to grow, Kligman's research empire was relatively unfettered by government or corporate strictures. The only hint of oversight came in 1966 when a study of DMSO came to light. Kligman orchestrated a clinical study of the drug at Holmesburg against the government's wishes. A lengthy two-part article on the DMSO experiment that appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association only made the matter worse. A subsequent FDA investigation of Dr. Kligman's prison research program found numerous discrepancies and resulted in his disqualification as an authorized researcher of investigational new drugs. The stiff governmental sanction, which had only occurred once before, mobilized Kligman and his defenders. They lobbied the government, arguing the great harm that would be done by closing the Holmesburg research program, and they pleaded for another chance. Surprisingly, the government relented and gave Kligman back his lucrative status as an investigator of new drugs. Part of his penance was his public admission that the DMSO experiment was in error. It was during this period and in subsequent years that Kligman would embark on some of his most dangerous experiments. Documents show he contacted numerous corporate and government entities to test an array of dangerous substances. Dioxin for Dow Chemical, tobacco for R.J. Reynolds, chemical warfare agents for the Army, and his own radioactive isotope studies. Those were just some of the experiments initiated by the Penn researcher at Holmesburg. In the dioxin studies, the first time the powerful carcinogen had ever been applied to human beings, Kligman exposed dozens of prisoners to initially modest but increasing levels of the chemical according to the Dow protocol. When those levels proved unsatisfactory, Kligman altered the protocol and increased the dosage 468 times, guaranteeing a positive reaction. Dow officials were stunned by this and severed their relationship with him. But a large array of either unknowing or uncaring corporate and government entities continued to seek him out for clinical research projects, and Holmesburg remained a test site. The mid and late 1960s became one of his most fruitful and economically rewarding periods. The Army Experimentation Study was a harsh story to tell because these guys took you into a trailer that sat in back of the prison and they gave you a drug. At that particular time, I had no dealings with narcotics at all. And I do remember that they gave me something that I didn't know where I was. They, in fact, the group had found me in the yard looking up at the sky, not knowing where I was. When they gave me this drug that they gave me. It took effect to me, and I'd be doing again to do other things, things that I would normally do, such as stick-ups and other things. 
And um, later, I became addicted to drugs, and I believe it had a lot to do with what they had given me. Uh, the drug was really something because I had a different, my, my fuse began to be short. I had a short fuse where before I had good tolerance, but the drug now had me on a short fuse thing. I became violent in some cases. I believe it was due to the experiments. Yes, sir. Well, I started having second thoughts about the test when I heard about individuals uh, going off uh, on the cell blocks and uh, going off in the uh, trailers where the United States Army was conducting all kinds of uh, drug tests and whatnot. Uh, they put two trailers behind Holmesburg Prison, uh, behind H Block, and uh, they had inmates uh, living in those trailers uh, for days at a time, experimenting with them with all sorts of drugs. And uh, some inmates like uh, actually snapped, went off. And uh, that's when we began to like really look at these studies. Uh, in the very beginning, they were relatively simple. They were like uh, mild lotion studies and, uh, you know, things of that sort, but things that wasn't uh, life-threatening. And then it got on to become, uh, it went on to become more inhumane and more barbaric. So what happened was, uh, out of concern, we just started talking about uh, it was time for, for them to, uh, you know, go back to what it was or either stop it. The experience of being an incarcerated human guinea pig for an assortment of academic, corporate, and government clinical studies left the test subjects with a decidedly negative view of Dr. Kligman, as well as the University of Pennsylvania and the medical establishment in general. Doctors and hospitals could no longer be trusted. While many seemed to profit from the research, particularly the physicians and the high-powered institutions they work for, all the test subjects have to show for it is scars and bad memories. Their moral outrage with the people who use them remains to this day. These were the broke, brokest of broke people, okay? And so when, when people ended up in Holmesburg, this was the poor uh, and the working class, petty thieves, uh, what have you, uh, for the most part, the largest part of the population. I think it says that ethically and morally they're bankrupt. That's what it says. It says if, uh, you know, if, if you want to make money and continue the never-ending expansion of universities, if this is how far they'll go to do that, then it shows that they're ethically and morally bankrupt. So I never really trusted doctors from that day on. I believe in science, but uh, I don't believe in them taking uh, a person that's healthy and giving him a disease to try to find out a cure when you have enough people running around with these illnesses. And this is exactly what he was doing to us in these jails. He was taking healthy people, because when I went there I had nothing wrong with me. I had a perfect bill of health. I came out, I'm totally deteriorated right now today, you know. The doctors, I'm going to the doctors, H, my HMO, I done spent a million dollars with them, and they ain't gave me no diagnosis as far as my gastrointestinal problem, and why is my joints de deteriorating? But I, I really saw it as a, a very class thing uh, with an additional racist element. I feel as though I was treated as a human guinea pig, you know, to, to perform research for the University of Pennsylvania and Dr. Cleveland to get rich by in which he did. Me and all the other inmates, the ones that died, that died, and the ones that's living right now today. Most of the guys that I know are afraid of doctors. They ruined my life. My, my leg not only was severed, but it's ugly. Uh, my children, when they were growing up, I couldn't go out onto the beach with them. Uh, it, it, I didn't want to draw attention to myself and to my children. I don't trust them. I mean, after, I mean, these were doctors that were supposed to be helping me. Instead of helping me, they hurt me. And why did they hurt me? For a person, personal gain is what it boiled down to. For their personal gain, I got hurt. I just can't, I can't understand how someone in America could act like he's over an ostrich somewhere in World War II. How could he uh, dispense this type of toxic poison into human beings? I, I never met the gentleman, but I'll tell you something, he is real sick. They say he's rich, 
but he's rich at our expense. You understand? He needs to see us. He needs to look at what he did to us. You understand? I, 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 uh, uh, I don't, I don't want to punch him in his mouth or anything like that, but I do want to go in his pocket. I'm, he needs, he's got millions, and he's got the nerve to fight us, to fight us. Listen, he, it's not just Holmesburg. This was going on nationwide, and one in particular was in Tuskegee. So, you know, it was going on. Uh, uh, how could they do that? They take poor people, uh, indigent people, and just ignorant people, uh, uh, illiterate people, and just do anything they want. In their defense, Dr. Kligman and the University of Pennsylvania have argued that they didn't do anything particularly unusual. They were right to step in with other clinical researchers and scientific institutions doing such work at the time. As it reinforces the feelings that many people have that they can't trust the medical profession, they can't particularly can't trust white doctors, they can't protect, trust white health professionals because they don't believe that they have their best interests in mind. Um, and that's not simply paranoia because when one goes to a doctor or one goes to a hospital, you do not divorce all the other experiences that you've had in life. So to the extent that you've been interacting in a society which makes you distrustful generally whether or not it's going to get a job or to get into school, and then you learn that not only can you not be comfortable in, in, in trusting people in those regards, but the doctor whom you would expect to be able to, to trust to have your interests has been guilty of blatant abuses. And just as when we look at Tuskegee, one wants to say, well, maybe this is, has nothing to do with race. I mean, you keep hoping that. The reality is that when you get these repeated examples where the people being exposed and disrespect are African Americans, then that travels throughout the community. And that's passed on from generation to generation, from community to community. And we've got to stop that. The whole profession gets out of step with fundamental human international values um, is something that should be touted as a problem, not as a defense. There is no question about it because the evidence is incontrovertible. What was done under the auspices of the University of Pennsylvania was a perversion of what medicine is supposed to be. And if that doesn't happen in historical perspective, then it means that American medicine has become bankrupt. Well, there is no question that uh, Al Kligman was a model for many trainees at the University of Pennsylvania. And at first, I think for most, a positive one, because he was engaged in teaching, although his teaching was, like almost everything else, extraordinarily superficial. Uh, no depth, um, no preparation, really, and largely anecdotal, but entertaining. And so um, there was, um, at first, a certain inclination to model oneself after Kligman. By the time I left the University of Pennsylvania um, to go to Boston, I had determined for myself that Kligman was the antithesis of what I wanted to be professionally and personally. And so he became an extraordinary negative model for me. For many of my colleagues, however, contemporaries, and for those who went before me and for some after, Kligman became a model for um, making money in medicine by pandering to pharmaceutical and cosmetic companies and by, in some ways, um, extracting huge sums from them by giving them what they wanted to hear and without doing work in a serious way basically operating and manipulating. And I think that in this respect, his legacy is also less than what it might have been by a lot. There are, however, some observers who don't share that assessment. Moreover, most of the former test subjects believe they are still owed something. The Holmesburg prison medical experiments are gradually taking their rightful place next to Tuskegee, Fernald, Willowbrook, and the other infamous names in the pantheon of unethical human experimentation in America. 
but for the men and women who endured these clinical trials at the county prison in Philadelphia. The fears, doubts, and concerns remain. In short, their struggle continues. Some buddies of mine, we were talking about this in the cell over Holmesburg, and said, you know what, I'm sorry that I got on that, you know, because it meant 30, 40 years from now, there may be some repercussions behind this. And now I see what they mean, because the side that they injected the stuff on me is a side that I have cancer. I have cancer in my brain as a result of it. I have cancer in my bone. And I cannot, you know, my functioning is limited. You know? And I was a healthy young man. Dr. Kligman, I can't stand him. To me, he violated everybody that was there with these experiments, because he knew what he was doing to the inmates over there. And the city knew what, the, the, what was going on over there. Everyone had got financial gains from this. They made millions of dollars off of this. We found out later what was going on. And we're deeply hurt behind that, because we ain't got a dime. We got a stipend, you know, for what they subjected us to. It should be punished, you know. And I'm, my, And as I think about it, you know, I mean, when me and my son, we went to the cancer clinic, and they told me I had brain cancer, and they couldn't give me a, a time frame as to how long I may have here. You know, he started crying, I started crying. My mother, she started crying. She's 80 years old, you know. I mean, it's been, it's been rough. They should compensate. They haven't even acknowledged no one about compensating anybody. Clickman, he living out off the hall. He's a millionaire. We poor. Ain't got a dime. As a community, we carry the weight of a history that has been marred by exploitation and oppression. For too long, our stories have been relegated to the shadows, overshadowed by the narratives of those in power. It is crucial for us to confront the uncomfortable truths about the medical experiments inflicted upon us. Experiments that not only stripped away our dignity, but also sought to reduce our existence to mere data points. The Tuskegee syphilis study, the Willowbrook State School study, and the Philadelphia Human Experimentation are stark reminders of how our lives have been used and abused. Furthermore, the documentary Acres of Skin serves as a vital testament to the ongoing struggle against medical exploitation. The Tuskegee Syphilis Study, which stretched from 1932 to 1972, represents one of the darkest chapters in medical history. African American men were misled and manipulated, deprived of treatment for syphilis under the guise of receiving health care. Instead of being treated, they were observed like lab rats, left to suffer the ravages of a disease that could have been treated. This betrayal runs deep. These men were not mere subjects. They were fathers, brothers, and sons, individuals with dreams and aspirations who deserved respect and care. The cruelty of this experiment is a stark reminder of how we have been historically dehumanized, our lives viewed as expendable. The Willowbrook State School study, which took place from the 1950s to the 1970s, adds another layer to this tragic narrative. Children, many of whom were African-American, were deliberately infected with hepatitis in a setting that was supposed to care for them. These vulnerable children were stripped of their agency, used as subjects in a study that prioritized scientific inquiry over their well-being. This systemic exploitation reflects a fundamental failure to recognize the humanity of our children, treating them as mere tools for research rather than individuals deserving of protection and love. The Philadelphia Human Experimentation during the 1960s and 1970s underscores the ongoing pattern of medical abuse directed toward marginalized communities. Various studies conducted in psychiatric hospitals targeted vulnerable populations, including many African Americans. Our mental health struggles were exploited for the benefit of a system that has long ignored our voices. This trend illustrates a troubling reality. We have often been seen as subjects for experimentation rather than as people worthy of compassion and care. In addition to these harrowing studies, the documentary Acres of Skin shines a light on the abuses within the medical system. 
particularly at Holmesburg Prison in Pennsylvania. Here, incarcerated black men were subjected to a range of experiments without informed consent, treated as if their bodies were mere laboratories. This visual narrative powerfully illustrates the systemic exploitation we have faced and the urgent need for accountability within medical research. It is a stark reminder that our suffering has often been minimized and our dignity stripped away in the name of science. Understanding these experiments is not just an exercise in recalling our painful past. It is essential for reclaiming our narrative and empowering our future. Acknowledging these historical injustices allows us to confront the deep-seated distrust many in our community feel toward medical institutions. This distrust is rooted in the very experiments that sought to exploit us, and only by facing this history can we begin to heal. Knowing our history reinforces our resilience. Despite the numerous atrocities we have faced, we have always found ways to fight back, to organize, and to uplift one another. Our survival is a testament to our strength and unity. By learning about these injustices, we honor those who suffered and fought for their dignity. We stand on their shoulders as we continue the fight for justice in healthcare and beyond. This knowledge is also a call to action. We must ensure that history does not repeat itself. As we navigate a world filled with medical advancements, it is our responsibility to advocate for ethical practices and informed consent. We must challenge systems that seek to exploit us, demanding transparency and accountability from medical institutions. Our voices matter, and we have the power to shape the future of healthcare for our community. Understanding the medical experiments conducted on African Americans, along with the narratives presented in Acres of Skin, is vital for our community's growth and empowerment. We must confront these painful truths acknowledge our suffering, and rise together in solidarity. Our history is marked by struggle, but it is also filled with resilience and hope. Let us reclaim our narrative, honor those who came before us, and fight for a just and equitable future. Our lives matter, our stories matter, and we will not be silenced. <laughs>